You're listening to part two of a conversation from season one between Craig Kakowski, a lover of Tom Waits, and Tamara Federici, producer of every band ever. Tamara is currently at work with a Malaysian pop band and was unable to record this week's episode. We'll be back next week with more newfangled episodes, you sexy animals. The spoken word piece on this album is 19th and Hennepin, where uh, where he starts out, it's 19th and Hennepin, all the donuts have names that sound like prostitutes, <laughs> which I feel like I understand that lyric, but I'm curious as to what were the names of the donuts that sounded like prostitutes. There was one that was just called uh, Coconut Cone. Okay. <laughs> there was one that was, it was called a Bronchi Strawberry. Raunchy Strawberry. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. That does sound like a prostitute's a, name. Yeah. And there was um, something called a Chlamydicone. And that was an ice cream. That was a donut and ice cream mixture. It was not ordered very much. No, I wouldn't order Chlamydicone. I want to look at it, but I don't want to lick it. Ugh. You're listening to part two of a two part conversation between Craig Kikowski, a fan of Tom Waits and Tamara Federici, producer of every band ever, already in progress. Probably the best known song on the album, it would not be the Tom Waits version, it would be Downtown Train, which was covered by Rod Stewart. Did you also do the Rod Stewart version? I did. And what what was the difference between working with Tom or working with Rod? Oh my God. Rod is mostly ladies' legs. He's mostly made up of ladies' legs, I feel like. like he's, anything he does, any an album he makes, there's always a, like, a pair of ladies' legs and high heels. And I feel like in his soul, his soul parts are just ladies' legs and black high heels. And um, for me, that's, you know, when we were making that, uh, his version of um, Downtown Train, that's, that's the vibe I get is it's, he can be singing anything and it's all going to go back to like, him in a with his uh you know tie off sitting down with some legs behind him (laughs) that's he just sounds like that to me even downtown train so i was thrilled about tom waits version i feel like that's a really uh you know for me personally that's more my style now tom waits did it first though right or or what's what's the order of that because i feel like i knew Mm -hmm. It, this might have been that I discovered Rain Dogs after the Rod Stewart version had come out, and then I was so surprised to hear it uh, in Tom Waits' voice because it's it's so different, but clearly the same song. I think it's the way that you're saying, um, but I I, I change I, I mix up my timelines a lot, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was the other way. But I I do think it's I think Rod Stewart originated it, and then it was Tom Waits. But it doesn't it doesn't it kind of doesn't make a difference to me. It doesn't so. matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Right. And th- there's one other rock icon who I'm curious about who does appear on Rain Dogs as well, which is like he uh, he plays guitar and sings backup on a couple songs. Keith Richards. I know. I couldn't believe that. I mean, like, I made a call, but I didn't think he was actually going to come. I mean, that's so. Because <laughs> you, you knew him from producing Stones albums? Right. Yeah. And I. He, I just thought they might get along because they have some sort of like, Tom Waits is so, uh, uh, let me talk to the stapler. Let's see. Let's, you know, he's kind of just in a, in his own place about, uh, you know, I will be, uh, anointed with this song, uh, at the right moment. So why don't we go ahead and have rehearsal and I'll be crap. But then sometime halfway through, it's really going to kick in and it'll be amazing. And even if we stop the lyrics halfway through, uh, that's going to be great. And so Keith Richards sort of musically is a little bit like, not jingly jangly, but you know, you can see him being a little like uh, fluid, like a fluid thinker, I guess. So um, yeah, that was really fun. They, you know, I mean, I can talk a little bit about that was um, they just like, you know, like those maracas that they have in, um, in uh, like kids, like kindergartens or something. They, sure. they actually didn't say it. They never said hello. Children's maracas. Children's they're smaller, maracas. They're smaller, smaller. Than, than full-size maracas. A little higher maybe. Too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> smaller beans inside. But um, What kind of beans? Uh, I think those are little pintos, baby pintos. Little pintos, but okay. I'm only doing it by ear. I haven't seen it by sight because they, they hide them in there. 
I would be um, worried that if Tom Waits had a maraca, he'd want to crack it open to get to the beans. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think it didn't happen that he didn't think of it in that moment. And they just, okay. they didn't say hello. They said hello through the maracas and they were shaking them in the off beats, you know, like, and then they just shook them back and forth at each other for a long time. Uh, we took a break. We went out to have dinner and we came back and they were still shaking them at each other. And then they finally said, oh, hello. <laughs> and then they started working together. So that was pretty so, magical uh, until. So you know. Tom and Keith just communicated via maracas for hours at a time. They're more physical uh, collaborators than, <laughs> than, you know, wordsmiths, I think. Well, I mean, not wordsmiths, um, you know, than uh, intellectual verbal verbal people only so there, there's 19 tracks on the album was there stuff that you cut as well <laughs> he wanted to put a jingle on the album which was weird in the middle of all of these songs he like wrote, a commercial jingle yeah for what yeah. uh i think it was for it was for belks which is a defunct department store it, it would have been active at the time right 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 yeah, it was a jingle for Belks, and it was sort of like, what do you, this doesn't match. This doesn't match anything that we have. Secondly, it's a commercial that nobody asked you to write. And um, I mean, he could probably fill another album with jingles nobody asked him to write. <laughs> so, was he hoping to get a deal with Belks? I, I'm not sure what he was going for. I think he just artistically was inspired by Belks, um, which nobody has been. He might be the only person inspired by Belks, but he kind of weirded out himself a little bit. It was, it was like, why are they shopping in there? It might have been something like so that. it was similar to what's he building in there? Right, which he had already, right. He had that already in his pocket. I mean, he's like, why are they shopping in there? I mean, he didn't I say feel whispery. like that's, that's not a great endorsement for Belks of why are they shopping in there? <laughs> it's more of an indictment. Yeah. Maybe he's curious. He's a lurker. It's a lurking song. So that's always got to be a difficult conversation then as a producer when an artist wants a track on the album and you know it's not right and you have to talk them out of it. Uh, what What's your methodology for, for approaching that conversation? Or does it differ according to the artist? It differs according to the artist. And uh, for Tom Waits, what that means is when you are asking him to take something out of an album, it means you're going to go to the top of the clip you're gonna you're going to have a totem you're going to toss it over that cliff and you're gonna say goodbye to it together as he slowly plays the accordion okay so as long as there's a ceremonial disposing of the track that right. he's cool with it right one time we tied a cassette to a pigeon and just let it fly away wow and that's how we get stuff to that's how we choose what the final tracks are some things have to go Awesome. Well, uh, how how was Tom uh, satisfied with the, the the final version of the album? He really liked it, uh, but he doesn't show his appreciation outright. You know, you just find you find a flower on your doorstep for like twelve days, and then um, you know you know that you did a good job. Awesome. But let me <laughs> let me ask you something. What is your what um, I don't know what what when you were the age that you were when you were listening to this album. Um, what drew you in about this? What was the most exciting part of hearing of hearing this? I mean, it's it's partially the uniqueness of his voice, like that that gravelly voice. Like I think is an instant turnoff for so many people. Like really? you hear ten seconds of Tom Waits, and and a lot of people are going to be out already. But I was kind of drawn in. The first track I remember hearing by him, well, MTV used to play the video for In the Neighborhood which was like really weird and black and white. And like, it just, it didn't feel like a real song. Like, and so I was kind of put off by it. And then I was in college and I remember hearing, uh, I think it's called I'll Be Gone, which is a song from Frank's Wild Years. Uh, and in the morning I'll be gone. Uh, and I thought it, it sounded so cool and weird. And is it as if it was from another era entirely so i started to become a fan like based on that and then so i think frank's wild years is the first one i got then swordfish trombones then eventually rain dogs and uh and i've i've stayed pretty pretty on top of his stuff 
since then. Um, and then going all the way back to the beginning, he was more of like a singer songwriter type. Like his voice was a little smoother on the first album. It was still kind of weird, but like he was more in a tradition of like LA singer songwriters yeah, uh, in the early seventies. Yeah. Yeah. More of a lounge singer. Yeah. Than a drunk uncle and wandering through the woods <laughs> <laughs> with a piano though. <laughs> I, I do think that like, the best artists are able to like distill their influences in interesting ways. Like, like the Beatles and Nirvana are probably my two favorite bands, but also like they're the most derivative bands in some ways. They just took some from so many influences and mashed it together in a new way. And later after being a Tom Waits fans, I listened to some Hal and Wolf and to some Captain Beefheart. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he yeah. he got quite yeah. a bit from Helen Wolf and Captain Beefheart. Totally. Right. Yeah. But he's also uniquely himself. I'm not saying he's a ripoff. I'm just saying I can hear the influences and in how he turned it into a new thing. Yeah, he was totally influenced by Captain Beefheart for sure. That uh yeah. I, I think I tried to get into Captain Beefheart and he's sort of um He's even uh, harder than Tom Waits. He is much. But I kept trying, like he's, you know, I mean, I definitely, you know, we we did some stuff together, but it was sort of, I really wanted to be that cool and I couldn't, I couldn't get there quite. So, you know. That's got to be an awkward conversation. As the go-to producer for everyone, there must be artists who want to work with you. And then, you know, you know of like, I'm not really into what you do, man. But like, let's work together. Right. I'll, I'll find the place. Like, unless they are, uh, you know, unless something has been violated, I'll, I'll work with them. In other words, like, uh, in my, daughter, in my daughter's Jugtown band, I won't work with, you know, I won't work with animals and I won't work with, uh, you know, awful animals who are mean to people. And I learned my lesson and I'm not doing that. So. Oh, so you're thinking of the River Bottom Nightmare Band specifically. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, because that because Emmett, Emmett and his band right, are pretty right. sweet, and they just play jugs. But I think the River Bottom Nightmare Band is particularly uh, they're it's, egregious. It's the meanest animals in the swamp. Indeed, I mean, and they're also a Christmas band. And I, uh, if you only play once a year, I feel like that's weird. And I should have, I should have seen that coming. And also, a snake in a band is that's not good. That's not good. Right, because you're going to have to have a bowl of water for the snake. <laughs> to uh to to swim in uh for the you know so there's a lot in the writer when you when you take that show on the road i guess that checks like all of your negatives right animals meanness and christmas yeah well i mean if they played other times during the year and then additionally christmas but also they're jerks they're unprofessional they're mean to emmett aller i'm like no no so i will not work with them again like so those things are you have to set a precedent for me to be like no no more but, yeah, I think boundaries boundaries are important. Yeah, and Rock has a hard time with boundaries, I feel like. <laughs> Greg, Greg, because you have such a great voice, and I, I'm i wondering if you could sing. I just think that the, it, it's so unexpected that it might, it might just work. So this is Tom Waits uh, with his song Time from Rain Dogs uh, with Lizzo. And it's time, time, time. And it's time, 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 and it's time, time, time that you love, and it's time, time, time. Turn up the music, turn down the lights, I got a feeling, gonna be alright, it's about damn time, time, time. Go to every band ever on Instagram for updates or to suggest a band. Craig Kakowski is an actor and improviser based in Los Angeles. People usually recognize him from Drunk History, Community, Veep, or dozens of projects he was not in. And Tamara Federici gave up on the pumpkin outfit and is going as a duck. The editor is Will Velasquez. The audio engineer is Clark Jackson. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Shake your leaves, shake your leaves. Oak tree, oak tree, oak tree, oak tree. Everybody sing together.